right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening. I'm Linda Reynolds, and I welcome you to the kickoff event for One Book, One Community, Stillwater Reads True Grit. This series is a collaborative program designed to foster a sense of community through a shared arts and reading experience and to broaden an appreciation of a historical period in U.S. and Oklahoma history. Major program sponsors are the Stillwater Public Library, Oklahoma State University Library, and Sharar Museum of Stillwater History. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, major sponsors are the Stillwater Public Library, Oklahoma State University Library, and Sharar Museum of Stillwater History. This project is supported in part by an award from the National Endowment for the Arts. Other funding partners include Stillwater Public Library Trust, Friends of the Stillwater Public Library, and Friends of OSU Library. Community partners include Stillwater Public Schools, Oklahoma Territorial Plaza, Oklahoma Wondertorium Museum, OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute, the City of Stillwater Community Center and Parks and Recreation, the Multi-Art Center, OK Quality Printers, and Stillwater Roundup. OSU partners include the Center for Oklahoma Studies, OSU Allied Arts, Oklahoma Oral History Research Program, the OSU Library Special Collections and University Archives, OSU Native American Student Association, OSU Student Union Activities Board, the Departments of History and English, the Native American Faculty and Staff Association, and Gender and Women's Studies. So as you can tell, we have a lot of people involved in this programming series, which we're excited. Before we begin tonight's programs, I want to highlight two of our upcoming events. On Saturday, March 14th, we invite you to learn about lost skills of the Old West. Participants will leave with food, candles, and the experience of handmade crafts from the True Grit era. Demonstrations will include Dutch oven cooking, spinning, candle making, and blacksmithing. This event is being held from 1 to, 4 at the, 1 to 5 at the Multi Arts Center. Registration is $25, and you need to register by March 9th to ensure that the program is not canceled. So I hope you will consider that event. And then Oklahoma Women with True Grit. This is an original play written by Julie Pearson Little Thunder, and it will share the stories of six tenacious Oklahoma women, including Rita Aragon, who, as a single mother, joined the Air National Guard in 1979 and became the first female commander of the Air National Guard and the first woman to hold the rank of Brigadier General. Wilma McDaniel, known as the Oki Poet, was born in Oklahoma, moved with her family to Oklahoma during the Dust Bowl, and published over 50 books of poetry and short stories, including many featuring her home state. And Vicki Miles Lagrange, she grew up in a segregated community and became one of the first two African American women to serve in the Oklahoma Senate and currently serves as chief, as chief U.S. District Judge for the Western District of Oklahoma. <coughs> Based upon oral history interviews collected by the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program, this play will be performed free of charge on the following three dates. Saturday, March 7th at 3 p.m. at the OSU Postal Plaza, Monday, March 9th at 4 p.m. at the OSU Library, and here, Tuesday, March 10th at 1 p.m. during the OSHA Lifelong Learning Institute Town Hall event. So both of those are, are in your brochure, but I just wanted to highlight those as, as upcoming events I wanted you to be aware of. For tonight's program, we have refreshments located in the hallway. They're courtesy of the Friends of the Stillwater Public Library. We have American Sign Language being provided by Brittany Statham and Destiny Reddick. We have um, sign language available at many of our programs. If you need to know about those, please check with me. And O-State TV is also here tonight recording our event. Restrooms are located across the hall and emergency exits are located at both ends of the hallway and across from these middle double doors. A reminder to turn in your completed evaluation in the yellow box after the program or you're more than welcome to leave it in your chair or on the table. And please silence your cell phones. After our very special guest speaker this evening, we will be showing a 30-minute documentary on the life and writings of Charles Portis. So now it is my pleasure this evening to introduce Rooster Cogburn, as portrayed by Dr. Clarence Benish. 
Dr. Vanish is head of faculty at Pawnee Nation College, where he teaches psychology, speech, history, and government. He has published a children's play, The Trial of Mother Goose, and has written five murder mysteries, including a Fort Smith murder mystery starring Rooster Cogburn, a character in which he has been playing now for 15 years. An actor since junior high, Dr. Vanish has acted at Town and Gown Theater here in Stillwater and at Playhouse in the Park in Murray, Kentucky. He currently owns the Buffalo Theater in Pawnee, and after his talk, he welcomes questions for either Rooster Cogborn or Dr. Vanish, as they know each other quite well. Please join me in welcoming Rooster Cogborn. Well, thank you, little lady. Can you hear me all right out there? <laughs> Well, I want to get one thing straight right away. You signed up that there won't be any quitting. Not by me or not by you. And if you could tell me what movie that came from, I've got two tickets. Tulsa Holder game. I ain't John yet. Who, who knows where that line came from? Two tickets here. Which tall thunder playing Tulsa Holder? March 13th. No, it didn't come. <laughs> There'll be no quitting along the way, not by you or not by me. Searchers. Go back a little further. Here you go, little brother. All right, now y'all get it. I'm here to talk about this book, The True Grit. And I'll tell you, it's a great book. And I'll tell you why you should read it. Well, first of all, let me see what kind of audience I have out here. How many people have already read the book, True Grit? That's what I figured. That's a pretty good percentage of you. How many of you have seen uh, John Wayne's version of True Grit? That's pretty good. How many of you have seen uh, Jeff Bridges' version, version of True Grit? How many of people have read the book and seen both? movies. How many people read the book, seen both movies, and played Rooster Cogburn in Court, in court Smith? That'd be me. All right. The very first time I played Rooster Cogburn was a, a millennium ago, 1999, Judge Parker's courtroom, Fort Smith, Arkansas. Anyway, so let's get started. Why should you read this book? If you ain't, well, I'll tell you. You won't even understand the movies as well as you should if you don't read this book because it gives a bigger picture of what's going on and the dialogue is wonderful. For example, and they leave out things in the movies. Like one of the things that really bothered me, and I was hoping the second true grit movie, they would be Include what was in the book. I ain't going to spoil it. I ain't going to tell you too much about the book, for those of you who haven't read it. But I'm going to tell you enough to tell you that the book is full of a lot more details. And one detail I particularly liked was the inclusion of Indian Marshals. You see, that movie was a great Oklahoma history movie because it covered a very unique period of time when all the law that was in this area, which we now call Oklahoma, came out of Fort Smith. When I say all the law, I meant all the U.S. law. Because each of the Indian nations had their own laws, had their own deputies. But, according to the treaties, U.S. law only applied to, to U.S. citizens and Indian law did not apply to U.S. citizens, so that attracted a lot of lawbreakers. They knew that the Indian nations couldn't arrest them unless they caught them in the act or something like that. They could only hold them. Well, the book mentions that when, true, when Rooster Cogburn goes and looking for his chief suspect. But they leave that out in the movies. I hate that. I hate it. But... Ain't nothing I knew, but you can read that and read other parts. So let's, uh, you got, first of all, anybody got a question about the book? 
Anybody have a question about it? All right. Well, I'll give you a little background. First of all, in the 1830s, five of the largest Indian nations from back to southeast were moved here. If you know your Oklahoma history. And they were called the five civilized tribes. And they were a lot more civilized than the white folks that were running around these parts. And so that's why they had to set up a federal court in Fort Smith, right there on the border. And you know, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, just a little tidbit, but it's actually kind of related to the book. You know that the border, the eastern border of uh, Oklahoma there is not straight? You ever notice that? Kind of jogs right there at Fort Smith? And it goes, uh, let's see which way does it jog? <laughs> it jog, yeah, toward the southeast. You know why? Well, it's because those Arkansas farmers that were living on the border thought they could fudge a little bit on their land into the Indian nations. Choctaw Nation being one right there on the Red River, eastern border of the state. So they fudged. And they fudged so well and for so long, they finally decided to move the boundary a little bit. So that was just some of the shenanigans that the white folks would do. Of course, the other shenanigan, which was one reason for the court, was they were selling spirits. Well, Brewster Cogburn liked to hit the ball every now and then, but it was legal in Arkansas, but not in the Indian nations. You couldn't make it, and you couldn't drink it. And that's still true in a lot of uh, the Indian nations today. Uh, over there at uh, Pawnee Nation, I have to leave my bottle outside the reservation. That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> but it's true. I would have to if I play any money. All right. Let me give some tickets away. All right. For those folks who have read the book, uh, what's one of the opening scenes in the book? That's close enough. Who you already got tickets, though? <laughs> no, I mean, describe one of the opening scenes in the book. Yes? Uh, the girl goes into Judge Parker's courtroom and, uh, the judge is uh, ruling on a case that, that on Rooster Cogburn. Actually, uh, that's not really at the beginning, but it's close enough. <laughs> Somebody, come on down. I got I'll a lot of these tickets. Can get them? Go ahead. <laughs> Several things happened before that. She had to know to go look for him. And so she did. She went down to, uh, well, first of all, why was she looking for uh, a U.S. Marshal with grit anyway? What, what? To avenge the death of her father. To avenge the death of her father. And why, who said that? Come get your tickets. <laughs> so uh, why were they in Fort Smith? They weren't for, from Fort Smith. He was going to go get ponies. Going to get ponies. Here, take another ticket back there for that, for that pony lady. And if you can tell me the name of the town that she was from. I do know that's why we went to Fort Smith. Starts with D. Oh, I heard it. Back drum here. right? No. That's <laughs> who said drum right? You got it back here. Huh? Dardnell. Dardnell. I'll get your ticket. I'll get them for you. <laughs> <laughs> we can just have her do it every time we want. <clears throat> well, okay. Enough ticket giving for a while. Well, let me tell you about this book. I was laying in bed the other night, and I thought, i got to tell them something special I haven't said before about this book. And then it dawned on me. It's the language. You know, right here in Oklahoma, 
we've got over a hundred, I think, Indian dialects and Indian languages. But in this book, there's uh, the law language that Rooster Cochran started to get a little familiar with. You know, he had a had to write a writ for a rat. <laughs> a right writ for a rat. I don't know the whole thing, but it's a pretty cute little story. And then in the courtroom, you hear him and the lawyers talking their legal language. Well, you heard another language, the language of bargaining, when little Darcy was down there trying to negotiate for her father's belongings and horse and all that stuff that had happened after he was killed. A merchant language, you might say. And then there's another language that's all through the book. And one of the movies did really well with it. And that's the language of a, of a, a young Methodist a church, kind of a church language. You know, uh, if you've been around as long as I have, you know, people used to talk that way. They had more of a uh, flowery and, and uh, biblical reference to most of their speech. And that's in the book. That's in the book. It's in the movie a little bit, but it's better than the book. And then, uh, of course, there's the language of the uh, veterans. Rooster Cogburn was an ex-Confederate and actually a guerrilla Confederate which made him a little bit outside the law, a little bit even for the rest of the Confederate Army. But he spoke a new language, with, uh, his law language as a U.S. Marshal, and then in the court he had to testify. And of course then his, uh, his uh, landlord, who was Chinese, you'd uh, pick up a few words from him. Oh, I forgot to bring my other prop. I have a cat who plays uh, General Sterling Price. <laughs> he, uh, he's actually quite a celebrity himself. He plays uh, another character, Tom Slick, King of the Wildcatters. <laughs> cat. Anyway, he's, he's an acting. He's an acting cat. And he looks just like General Sterling Price. And who was General Sterling Price? You have any idea? Well, he was the he was the major general in charge of the, of that district of the Western Theater for the Confederate Army. So he would be the supreme commander for all the, the Confederate forces during the Civil War. So it's only fitting that Rooster would name a cat after him. <laughs> all right, got any questions? You want to talk about the movies? Sure. Yeah. sure. All right. You got a question about the movie? <laughs> the differences. Well, a pilgrim uh, out there in a, oh, a little while ago asked me a question about every time I dress up this way, I hear this question, which is, what do you think of the new movie compared <laughs> to the old movie? Well, I've got an academic answer. You see, and I'm also an actor. So keep that in mind when I say what I'm about to say. Because, uh, you know, John Wayne fans can be pretty fanatic. <laughs> and I'm not uh, going to speak against them. But I want them to understand something. Jeff Bridges was not hired to be John Wayne. <laughs> he was hired to play the character Rooster Cochran as it's written in this book. Now, John Wayne couldn't help it when he was cast at that, uh, as that character. He couldn't help it to, be the, to become the main character. He couldn't help it. That's just the way he was. Main character in everything he was cast. I mean, you know, the Alamo. They should have called it uh, John Wayne's Last Stand instead of the Alamo. Because <laughs> that's, well, that's what you remember. But the 
movie is True Grit. So here's the $64,000 question. Who had True Grit? Well, not if you ask John Wayne fans. <laughs> but if you read the book, it's the little girl. Yes, True Grit. He, she talks about Brewster Carver having grit. But uh, who else had grit? Well, the girl, but who else besides the girl and rooster had grit? If you read the book, you'll, you'll see it's more than just one person with true grit. But the movies, well, they're, they're done a little different. And that's because you can't get all the details in there, include all the language. You've got to read the book. And what's the most famous line? I got four tickets for this word. <laughs> what's the most famous line from the book in the movies? Well, you gotta say the whole thing. Oh no. Mighty bold talk for a one eyed fat man. Well, that's part of it. There's actually a dialogue, and we've got two parts of it. The original line that, uh, well, it, it, it's something I've done a couple times in front of the Buffalo Theater there in Pawnee. I hired some uh, gunfighters out of Copan. Now, since it's a family show, I have to kind of adjust, like the little lady here. She's too much of a lady to say the line. So I make my adjustments for the Stillwater Poppins Library. Anyway, Ned Pepper and his gang is coming down the street. And they see me. They say, clear the way, rooster. And I say, I don't think so. And then he says, what are your intentions? And then that's when I say the most famous line that leads to the more famous line. <laughs> I ain't gonna kill you in one minute, Ned, or see you hang back at Fort Smith at Judge Parker's convenience. Which will it be? And then he says, well, I'd call that pretty brave talk for a one-eyed fat man. <laughs> Show your hand, you son of a bleep! <laughs> See how I handled that? <laughs> All right, so you guys come down and get your tickets. That little lady back here. All right, that line, I got a little, I got a little story about that, that line. It's different in both movies and in the book. If you don't read the book, you won't know that. <laughs> you won't know that. In fact, uh, uh, Jeff Bridges says it entirely different. Less emotion and uh, less caffeine. <laughs> but, uh, he says it really closer to, 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 the, uh, to the book version. Because there is three different stories being told there. That's why I'd encourage you to read this book and stay for the, for the whole group discussion and all that. Any other questions? All right, I'll keep talking. Uh, we have a question. Pardon? Yeah. There's the movie Rooster Cogburn, right? Oh, yeah. And then there's the movie True Grit. Which one came first chronologically? Well, uh, that's, that's easy. True Grit came first because uh, Rooster Cogburn uh, refers to things that happened, I believe. In, in the movie Rooster Cogburn, uh -huh. it's later. Of course, he's older, too. I mean, it, the character of John Wayne is considerably older. Uh, in fact, because of my youthful appearance, I haven't really uh, grown into the part. Yes, uh, <laughs> but you can ask that other fellow, that uh, Dr. Benish there. Good looking fellow, by the way. Yeah, uh, yeah, so he can grow into the part. Especially the Rooster Cogburn part, because uh, that's uh, it's one of the last movies that John Wayne made. Of course, he got some pretty high awards for that one, too. Any other questions? 
Books on the movie, yes. The author, when he wrote this book, True Grit, do you think he had John Wayne in mind to play his part? <laughs> you know, uh, I have not ever had that question before, and I'm glad I didn't, but I don't know it now, I didn't know it then. Uh, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I'll see if I can find out next time I do this. But I have a feeling, uh, if, if just my gut feeling, the movie's, I mean, the book is about her. I got a little lady out here. She's my little sister. She's sitting there about the third row back here. This used to be her favorite movie, book. She said, it's all because of the girls. See, because of the girl, women's rights and all that. <laughs> yeah, well, it, you know, very assertive. 14-year-old girl doing all that, bending her father's, and this pretty rough country, Indian nation, and Arkansas there. But, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's quite a, quite a book. We haven't even talked about that. Just for uh, women's rights alone, it's a, it's quite a, quite a book. Every young girl ought to read that book. They really, they really should. It's got. Uh, she sticks to her high moral standards, and she stays to the course along with her other marshals, which, you know, was played by John Wayne and <coughs> Lynn Campbell in the movie. But LaBeef, we haven't talked about LaBeef. <laughs> He's a pretty good character. Of course, you know what happened to uh, Lynn Campbell. The poor fella got cast next to John Wayne, and that ruined his acting career. <laughs> I ain't John, yes, when I've read that, and I've heard that many a time, and that's probably true. But uh, it's too bad. He probably had a little more acting ability. He certainly could sing. So he still can. Even with Alzheimer's, he can still sing. Power to him. He's got true threat. Any other questions? Well, let me tell you about. Uh, how the court worked, Judge Parker's court. Now, Judge Parker had just taken the court over from another guy who really uh, wasn't doing his business. And I don't know if he was just getting too long in his career or that wasn't up to the challenge. But when you talk about this large area and having to send out U.S. Marshals, uh, it was a daunting task. And uh, you ever heard of Bass Reeves? Yeah. Uh, he's a really U.S. Marshal, and he contrasts his Rooster Cogburn quite a bit because he brought in all oh, a thousand or so. He didn't kill but about a dozen of them. And if you read the book or watch the movies, true. Uh, True Grit or Rooster Cogburn, you'll find out that Rooster wind up killing most of the people he was supposed to be trying to bring in. Oh, here's another story I bet you didn't know. That line I gave you earlier. I aim to kill you in one minute. We have somebody here fairly local that used that line. Do you know who that was? That's right. Just two tickets for that lady. <laughs> this old Pete. And he was hunting down the killers of his dad. And up a little place up there in Kansas. I'm going to go up there someday just so I can say I've been there. He rides up on a horse. Now, it's several years after the killing of his dad. And the man comes out of his cabin, looks up there and says, who are you, son? He says, I'm Frank Eaton's boy, and I ain't gonna kill you in one minute. <laughs> he didn't say anything about or take you back. Because <laughs> there was only one option, and he did. He killed him in one minute. 
And he had another feller who was in along that killing gang of his father. He was just in a saloon not far from there. Or at least that's what he had heard. But by the time he got over to there and found out about him, he had already been killed by somebody else. But Pistol Pete, if you know the story, he hunted them all down and made sure they were all dead. So, uh, and also, uh, the, the line, uh, the, uh, this, the whole scene where Rooster Cogger takes on the Ned Pepper gang, that's very similar to something that, uh, that uh, Pistol Pete, we're all cowboys here, aren't we? We don't have anybody from OU, do we? I got a rope out of the truck. All right, just check it. You know, I have a lot of fun with this over to Lawny Nation. Now, you think, well, how can a John Wayne character be teaching at Lawny Nation College? Well, I, now, I tell him, I'm not playing John Wayne, I'm playing Rooster Cogger. And he went after Killer of Indians, so don't you get me mixed up with that other fellow. <laughs> that calms him down a little bit. But I find out it's kind of funny sometimes when they talk about OU, the Sooners, or the Oklahoma State, the Cowboys. It's a hard decision for them Indians. You gotta, you either gotta go root for the team that stole your land, or root for the team that was shooting at you. <laughs> well, since the Pawnees are a warrior nation, they kind of like the shooters. Some of them do, but, but anyway. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Pawnees, if you don't mind. I mean, it's a little off the subject, but not really, because the Pawnees were already here at the time of, of uh, Rooster Cogburn and the time of that period. Now, they weren't all officially moved here. They still had a lot of land in Nebraska. But they had some relatives in the Wichita's, and they'd come down here. In fact, there was a time when every wild Indian that you ran into going across Indian territory was referred to as a Pawnee, whether he was or not. It was just kind of a nickname. That was just a very brief period of time. Because they would come down, and they still do this, for over 600 years, they have a reunion with the Wichita's. And they alternate every other year. A bunch of families will come down from the Wichita tribe and stay with the Pawnees. Next year, a bunch of Pawnees will stay with, with the Wichita. And they do that around the 4th of July weekend. That's their uh, homecoming weekend. And I suppose most of you know this, but the Pawnee Nation has been allied with the U.S. Army since 1864. You know that? It's, they've never been at war with the United States, ever. In fact, they're allies and still continue to be, receive uh, veterans' benefits as an independent tribal nation. One of the few, not one of the few to do that. In fact, I wish I had the Pawnee Nation flag here. Instead, I've got another blanket I'll be rattling off later after the show. Because on that Pawnee Nation flag, you've got seven arrowheads. Each one of them represent wars that they fought alongside the U.S. Army. And the first one, we know it as the Indian Wars. Except Pawnees were fighting with them. And here's one of their Traditional enemies. This blanket is a uh, Lakota Sioux Star blanket. And our powwow is on the 14th, coming. 
coming up here pretty quick and it's open to the public, you come on down and you can buy a ticket for that blanket. Well, so uh, the Pawnees are quite proud. They still are uh, veterans and they allied with the U.S. Army to fight against the Sioux who were their traditional enemies. And the Sioux had pushed them back quite a bit. But when they joined the U.S. Army, everything turned around. And they have one of the greatest war uh, histories, military histories, you can read about. It's, it's just fascinating. It's fascinating. And they're proud to be uh, in the military. But you don't draft a Pawnee. You don't draft them. They sign up. They sign up as a separate nation to uh, ally with the United States. And, to, and those last stars, there are arrowheads, are the current wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And did you know they even have a Pawnee unit? Yeah. Well, see, there's a lot of things you don't know. But that's why I'm here. Anyway, the Pawnees were in Oklahoma area off and on during the 1880s and 1890s. They weren't moved here as a complete uh, nation until after the turn of the 20th century. And that's kind of a sad story, and I won't go into that. But back to True Grit. Who's got a question for me? Moody or the book? Another reason to read the book. It's got an excellent description of eastern Oklahoma. Winding Star Mountains and, and all that. You know the True Grit was the original True Grit with John Wayne was not filmed in Oklahoma. You know that, right? It's up there in Colorado. Augusta Springs. Huh? Augusta Springs. Augusta Springs. And, uh, but Jeff Bridges for the was filmed in Oklahoma. Of course, both of you scenes from Fort Smith. Well, I got a little story about that. You know, uh, when I dress up this way and go to Fort Smith, they treat me a little different there. <laughs> uh, you know, people buy me drinks and stuff like that. Well, I, I thought I'd take a few of my friends over there and maybe you'd like to join me. It's spring break from over at Quality and Asian College. Maybe you want to join me this week. We'll go over there later. Anyway, so we were rolling into to the area, about ready to cross the river, not the Red River, the Arkansas River, and uh, go into Arkansas. But it was getting lunchtime. So I asked my passengers, and I was dressed like this. I had to patch up a little bit so I could see a little better. Right. I said, should we stop here or go into town? And about that time, the light went off behind me. Well, I just pulled off the interstate and gone through this little town, and, you know, the speed limit dropped about 30 miles an hour. I didn't drop that much. But I told my passengers, don't worry about a thing. <laughs> I've never got a ticket in this costume. And that's true. I've been stopped a few times, but when they see this, see this, they get my autograph, my, not on a ticket. And they go, oh. said, don't worry about a thing. So the policeman comes up, roll the window down, and he said, he was very apologetic. Very apologetic. I'm going to have to give you a ticket. I have to. It's Labor Day weekend. We can't give warnings. And you're about 25 over the limit. I could say it's 17, but I'm going to have to. Well, yeah, a man's got to do what a man's got to do. <laughs> and so uh, he said, Well, I'll go back and write it up, and I'll see you in a little bit. And so uh, he was back there, and I, I felt a little embarrassed because here's the first time I got a ticket for this. And my pastor said, Rooster, Rooster, did you see what was on his name tag? I said, no, I was just seeing dollar signs going away. <laughs> his 
name was Rooster. I said, really? You mean Rooster gave Rooster a ticket? Well, I'll find some more out about this. So uh, he comes back. He's very apologetic. He said, I can do the best I can do. It's as low as I can get it. But you know, I can't give you a warning. And I said, I understand. You got to keep the law. Uh, my passengers have, couldn't help but notice you got a little rooster there on your name tag. Is that your name? He said, no, not really. Uh, it's, they call me. You know, my dad owned the ranch up there in Colorado where they filmed the movie. <laughs> So he signs the ticket, Rooster. And I've got a frame back at home. <laughs> that picture only cost me $150. <laughs> but that's some of the things that happens when you're dressed like this. And, uh, anyway, any other questions? A rooster, Dr. Yes? Well, this isn't really about either one, but you've been to Fort Smith recently, and they were building the Gaskins Museum. Have they finished that? Because like, what we're reading is it'd be a really good cool time to go for a little vacation, a little weekend. So tell it. That's, that's right. They, they've done the groundbreaking for it. No, it's not up yet. And that was, I uh, got invited, in fact, to that. Uh, that was back in uh, last September. We got a little bit of it. Uh, and they have a, a statue of Bass Reeves there on the bridge. That's pretty nice. Uh, but I don't know how far they've gone, you know, it's completely, but, uh, yeah, that was a pretty good choice. The uh, U.S. Marshall Museum there in Fort Smith. You know, more U.S. Marshals were killed there out of that uh, area than all the other districts put together. It's a pretty rough time. Uh, a couple of books written on the hell on the border. And this Bass Reef story, that, uh, oh, I've got a story for you that's related to Bass Reeves. Now, I told you, well, maybe I didn't tell you, but the first time I played Rooster Cogburn was in Fort Smith courtroom. And you say, well, why did you do that? Well, they asked me to. Well, they asked me also to write the murder mystery for a fundraiser for the county museum. And they had the furniture there from the courtroom, the original furniture. It was pretty neat. Well, uh, I did that. Now, where was I going with that? Uh, so, yes. So I started doing that murder mystery in 1999 and done it several places, Texas, California, and different places. And uh, now I make up a story. Of course, it's fictitious, just like Rooster Cogburn, but even more fictitious. I have a, a moon gang instead of Bell Star, I have Bella Moon. You know. Anyway, I made up this U.S. Marshal. He was kind of based on a real U.S. Marshal. His name was, anyway, kind of a caricature of it. You ever heard of Dick Speed? Uh, the U.S. Marshal, uh, he was killed at uh, Ingalls. Well, I had a character, Rick Slow. <laughs> well, Rick Slow, he would go and he would dress up like a woman or a kid or something and infiltrate the bands of outlaws here in the Indian nations. Which, by the way, they would refer to this area as Indian nations. Indian territory, which of course a misnomer, would be all the nations, but generally they referred to as Indian nations during that time by at least a few people. So, uh, so I was starting these murder mysteries and I made up this little thing about uh, the anniversary of the first hanging. We'd have a big old celebration and a dinner and, and all that. So I've done these parties for over 15 years now. And, and when I do a party, I put the actual date. Well, what's today, it's the second? So I would put March 2nd, 1890 or something. But I'd keep the date, March 2nd, the same as today. Well, I've done these for 15 years, and I got to wonder, well, there's no such thing as an anniversary hanging dinner. 
although they did do a lot of celebrating around those first few hangings, but they put a stop to it by building a big old fence around there. It quit making it a spectacle. But the first few times, and I've got pictures of it, uh, there'd be two or three hundred people gathered, or maybe more, uh, for those hangings. So I thought, well, I'll just make up this fictitious holiday. But then I got to wonder, well, if there was an anniversary of the first hanging in Fort Smith, what date would it be? Now, there's two ways to figure that. First hanging under Isaac Parker, who later on became known as the hanging judge. He was never called the hanging judge during the time he was there. It was only uh, 20 years after he died that he was called that. Would it be the first hanging under him or his, the feller who was there for two or three years before him? I don't even remember his name. And I thought, well, I'll just look up both of them dates. You can do that. You can go to Fort Smith uh, Museum, uh, the Courthouse Museum. And what they do is uh, anniversary hanging ceremonies at the gallows where a park ranger will tell you who got hung today, what crimes they did, how they were caught, and how the trial went, and what happened on the day of the hanging. They had hung anywhere from one to six people on those gallows. You can look it all up. So well, there's the dates. So I've got the dates. And I was curious, and I've done a lot of these parties now. And I thought, did I ever actually do a party on the anniversary of the first hanging? And what do you think? Yeah, I sure did. Both of them. Either way, either way you look at it. I did both of them. So a little bit eerie. Well, another thing that was a little bit eerie was the fact that what my little Rick Slow U.S. Marshal was doing, Bass Reeves did the exact same thing. Now, this is where you're supposed to get out of the Twilight Zone music in the back. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Maybe my brain was operating back then when I was writing it or whatever, but that's just a little tidbit for you. So what was the date? Well, one of the dates was uh, September 8th. I don't remember the other. Uh, but I see I keep a copy of all the newsletters that I so I write a little newsletter for my murder mystery parties called the Fort Smith Shooter. No, that wasn't the name of their paper. <laughs> but that's what I call mine. And I put the date up there. But I check both dates. And uh, that'd be a great time to go to Fort Smith. Is uh, coincided, they do, it's only a 15 or 20 minute presentation, and they do it uh, at 1 o'clock and 3 o'clock, right there at the gallows. And so you can look it up and plan your trips around that and do it. I think it'd be good. Of course, you want to see the courtroom and the courthouse, the jail. And right across the big old yard is the county museum where the actual original furniture is and many other artifacts, and including stuff about Elvis <laughs> and stuff. Well, he, won't. he went through there once. <laughs> and some other, of course, they had a little Civil War battle there, too. So it's, a, it's really a neat place. In fact, if you're at the museum, you're only a, a, a short walk. Uh, for a one-eyed fat man, a pretty short walk, to the, the only, on the National Registry, historical whorehouse that's just down on the riverfront. Yeah, that's just about uh, uh, four or five blocks from the courthouse. So you can get, uh, you can get a hotel down at Holiday Inn, and you can walk to all these places. And don't forget to stop at Rooster's Rooster and, and uh, you know, have a good meal there. Or just give me a call, I'll take you, and we'll, we'll have some fun. What was the authority and the date for the forming of the U.S. Marshal Service? <clears throat> well, that's a question that's straight, up, or straight from the museum. 
When did they start the U.S. Marshal Service? And under what authority? I think they started back under George Washington, but I'm not really sure. I'm 245 years old today. The memory coins are out, by the way, in Bass Ridge is on the silver dollar yeah. with the warrant. There you go. Now, I, on the program, you've got some t people talking about the U.S. Marshals later on this week, this month, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I sure like you to be there and hear that. Uh, it's on that on the program. April 13th. <laughs> They're out of the Department of Justice. They were the first arm of the Supreme Court. They still are. They yeah. Are. Yeah. Uh, there are some mounted uh, U.S. Marshals. They came over to Cleveland here. Uh, that's how I found out about the groundbreaking they told me about, that, about it. Cleveland had a true grit day the last September, I believe it was, the Western Heritage Day. For some reason, they wanted me to come. And uh, they had some U.S. Marshals on horseback. They're genuine U.S. Marshals, and they carry guns. But they mainly are, you know, to uh, educate, entertain. U.S. Marshal Service, but don't mess with it. <coughs> I, this gun is not real. Theirs is. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Where did the term "life horseman" come from? Uh, I believe. Well, first of all, I've actually seen that historically. Uh, uh, the Europeans used to divide their cavalry units into light, medium, and heavy. And, and uh, the, the, the bigger horses carried more armor and had a bigger guns, or when well, they had guns, before that they just had more armor. And they used the light ones for speed and the medium for kind of to bridge the gap. So the, uh, the Chickasaw light horse, uh, the Indian nations, call all their Indian police light horse. And that would be for speed. You'd want a horse that could travel fast over the non-existent roads. <laughs> yes? You mentioned Frank Eaton. Was he a U.S. Marshal? Frank Eaton was a U.S. Marshal. But here again, uh, you'll have uh, some people talking about that at another later date. They could tell you more about him. But uh, yes, he was a U.S. Marshal. Mm -hmm. How'd you lose your eye, Mr. Coburn? <laughs> well, it's funny you should ask. <laughs> I like to tell this story about how. See, I was uh, working in the Confederate Army, and we were digging trenches outside of Petersburg. And uh, me and a bunch of the other privates were just working as hard as we could. But I noticed the captain up there standing in, under a shade tree, drinking tea. And my comrade said, Rooster, uh, how come we're doing all the work? And, uh, and he's sitting under that tree, making more money. Well, I'll go ask him. So I went up there, took my shovel, got out of the ditch, and walked up to the officer, and I said, Sir, uh, we're wondering how come we do all the work and, and you make more money. He said, well, that's easy, private. I can explain that. Take your shovel. Walk over here. Now take your shovel and hit my hand. I said, hey, don't question an order. Just take your shovel, swing as hard as you can, and hit my hand. Well, you got to obey order especially in wartime. So I swung back and just about ready to hit that hand. He pulls back. I hit that tree and the, and the shovel vibrates out of my hand. He said, now, I just demonstrated to you what ignorance is. And that is why you're down there and I'm up here. Now get back to work. So I grabbed my shovel and I went down there and started digging the ditch again. And, uh, well, the guy that sent me up there, he said, did you find out? He said, yeah, I found out. I had to do with ignorance. And, and he, was, uh, he was from Arkansas. 
He didn't know what ignorance was either. And I, said, well, I said, well, it's a fancy word, but I can demonstrate it for you. Here, take your, uh, take your, there wasn't any trees available. I said, take your shovel there and hit my hand. <laughs> anyway, that's how I got it. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me, Rooster, how come you're carrying a 45? Oh, that's easy. They don't make a 46. <laughs> what right, you you think of what did you think of Miss Maddie when you first met her, Rooster? Well, she had a lot of spunk, but I personally thought someone should have whipped her more when she was younger. But, uh, but she had just lost her daddy, so I gave her a little bit of latitude. But I found out she, she had true grit. Sure did. I had to. But anyway, me and LaBeef pretty well came to the conclusion at the same time. And that's dealt with pretty well in the book and in the movies, too. So. Any other questions? For Rooster, or Dr. Benish, or Never been right. <laughs> Elliot Mess. <laughs> um, slick. How are we doing on time, little lady? We can take a couple more questions. I thought Ann go. We're supposed to be here till about six in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> we won't like that one. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? I think someone's handing up. Oh, what other times have you acted? What other characters? Well, I, I mentioned Tom Slick, the king of the Wildcatters. Now, he's the reason there's a drum riot. Mm -hmm. And I started doing that character about five years ago. Here again, someone just asked me to. And uh, interesting fellow. If you don't know the Tom Slick story, you need to look it up. It's a true rags to riches story. I mean, if they made a movie about it, you wouldn't believe it. He literally was homeless and flat broke when he got his first gusher. And that was in 1912. And it's still pumping today. Yeah. Well, that was his first gusher. But he went out and leased a bunch of land back then, and uh, his uh, doctor told him, you're going to die young if you don't take a break from all this wildcat. Now, you know what wildcat is, where you drill for oil with no assurance that you're going to hit anything. You're just taking a shot in the dark. They call that wildcat. And he was the king of the wildcatters, and he still is. No one can meet his record. He opened up more oil fields in Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, everywhere. He could just look at ground and oil would come out. It's a, it's a wonderful story. I'll tell you a little bit about it. He was literally born in the oil field. Uh, his dad, the first oil field in the world, was the first oil well, commercial oil well, was Titusville, Pennsylvania. And his dad worked in there and took him out there and showed him how to smell for oil in the sand. It's a great, it's a great story, great story. But it has a little twist and curse to it. But I won't tell you that. Another time, I'd come back and do oil, Tom Slick. But uh, is there yeah. a biography on him? Oh yeah, yeah. There's only really one good one. It's out of somebody out of Louisiana wrote it. He didn't do any interviews or he was on the run too. Too busy. But uh, that well that came in on St. Patrick's Day, 1912. <coughs> about six months later, he decided he'd take his doctor's advice and, and go to the Orient. That's what they called Asia back then. It cost $2,000. Now, annual working man's salary was 500 a year. Okay, so $2,000. Of course, by that time, he was already working on his first million pretty quickly. When he came back, he was there for two years. 
when he came back, he had 2,000 wells with his name on it oh. in the drum ride area. Oh. And that was only the beginning. It's a fascinating story. But we're here to talk about U.S. Marshals. <laughs> And there's a lot of fascinating stories there. And probably the most fascinating is Bass Reeves. He even arrested his own son one time. And that's, that takes a Matt Bonner to go out and arrest his own son for murder. Now, he was acquitted, but he brought him in. In fact, Bass Reeves invented the prison wagon. Because before that, you could uh, uh, you just had to lead a few back on horses. You're pretty well limited how many you could bring in. Well, he figured if he could rig up a wagon with some bars on it, he could bring in 10 or 12 at a time. Now, they were paid by the head, you see. They got expenses, and they were paid more if they were alive. See, this is worth it. Uh, the movie True Grit, Rooster Cogburn, kind of conflict a little bit. There were some cases where they wouldn't pay you anything if you brought them in dead. It just depends. Each case was different how much award uh, bounty they would give the U.S. Marshals. But they always got their expenses. And that's why he was keeping his records. And that's a cute story, too, which they barely touch on in the uh, movies about Matty helping Rooster Cogburn with his expenses. Because he couldn't, couldn't write too well, and he, you know, probably barely could add. But, uh, so he came up with creative ways to pad his little expense camp. Any other questions? Just a point of trivia that you haven't mentioned about last week. Yeah. Who's that pro Oh, yes. And I heard this story. He escaped from his master in Texas and took refuge in the Indian nations. Now, the Civil War broke out, so it was a pretty good time to be a runaway slave in the Indian nations because everybody was busy with the war. Because we had our own Civil War here, too. Each of the tribes had almost equal numbers fighting on both sides. And that's a tragic story also. Well, he traveled tribe to tribe, and he wound up learning Comanche and, and several of the other Indian nation languages. Well, he was wanted to that tell the story for his mail. He was wanted for something, and they had him up at Judge Parker courtroom, and the jury was just about to deliver their uh, sentence when the court said we're going to take a short recess. Everybody clear the room and just leave me with the defendant. Now it was apparent that he was going to be convicted. I don't know what the crime was. But during the testimony Judge Parker heard that he had had all this experience traveling in Indian nations and he knew multiple Indian languages. And he thought, I'll give you a choice. I can deputize you a U.S. Marshal or let the jury come in and pass their sentence. What will it be? <laughs> well, he took the job, U.S. Deputy Marshal. When the court came back in, or the jury came back in, he said, Case dismissed. <laughs> so yes, he was an African American, and uh, and a darn good one. And, and one of the scenes uh, uh, that he, he nearly got killed. They they got the drop on him, <coughs> and they were going to kill him, and he acted like a a poor, ignorant uh, colored boy, ex-slave, just begging for mercy. And they were having a little fun with him. These are people, outlaws, that he was out to rest, but they got the drop on him. He said, well, please just let me say my prayers before you kill me. And, and he 
And they said, all right. I said, I'd like to read something from my Bible. And of course, <laughs> he reaches in and gets his Bible and pulls out a gun and, and it takes them both prisoner. After a little bit of persuasion. The that pistol will be on exhibit in the new museum on the family. There you go. So it's a fascinating story. And it really uh, uh, <coughs> eclipses uh, uh, the rooster story. But, uh, he did he did exploits that were just practically unbelievable. And how do U.S. Marshals go out? Uh, I mean, were they assigned a person, or were they just out looking for the bad guys? Well, that's a good question. And in the book, they kind of mentioned that they were given warrants to look for certain people. But they were also given John Doe warrants. So they could just fill it in later. If they ran across somebody making moonshine. See, I had a character in my murder mystery called Boots Lager. And uh, he's out making moonshine. Of course, after the offense, what well, the capital offense. Oh, well, that's an interesting part about the book and about the time period, too. I'll probably get to close it run out of time here, but uh, because of the laws, the capital offense was rape and murder, and it had to, uh, there only one sentence, there was only one sentence that could be given for those, hanging. And uh, so Judge Parker, he sentenced something like 88 folks to, to hang, but they didn't all hang because some of them uh, got their cases uh, overthrown or commuted later on appeals. But the judge had no choice. He was bound by the law of time. If they were convicted, that was the only sentence they could get for those two crimes. So, we about done, little lady. Okay. <laughs>